Well, hello there, and welcome to Christchurch Anglican's uh, Wednesday Blessed Little Thought. I'm the Reverend J.D. Cope. This is August 12th, and we're glad that you are here with us today. And we trust, as uh, Father Ted often says, this will be the, the best 15 minutes of your day. So uh, we will open with some prayers. Um, then we'll have a Bible reading and reflection a little bit on that, and then close uh, with a couple of prayers, some announcements, and send you on your way. So... The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Let us pray. Almighty God, give us the increase of faith, hope, and love, and that we may obtain what you have promised. Make us love what you command through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen, indeed. That was the collect that we, if you were in church with us or online with us this past Sunday, you would have heard read, and that's a collect appointed for this week. And it emphasizes some of the themes uh, about which we'll be speaking today, namely faith, hope, and love. And as we're going to see, in particular through the words of the Apostle Paul today, the appeal for our faith, as I preached about this past Sunday, which you can find online also, the, the grounding of our faith, the, the object of our faith is the unswerving, unwavering promise of God that was secured on the cross and through the resurrection for us by Jesus, his son. And that is the, the hub, that is the nexus, that is the, 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 that around which the entire Christian life is situated. And when we forget that, as we'll see, when we um, have events in our lives that challenge the efficacy or the veracity, the truthfulness of that promise of God himself, well, then that brings up doubts and fears. And that's when we return once again to what we know about God. But I don't want to get too far ahead. I want to see how this works out in the Apostle Paul. We heard preached on Sunday about how it worked out in the life of the Apostle Peter, but we also thankfully have many more witnesses to the resurrected Christ in the life and work of the early church, and most notably we have the Apostle Paul. So if you were in church on Sunday, you would have heard the reading was um, somewhat um, abbreviated and abridged from the beginning of Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 5, which we'll now read and then I will explain. Paul writes, I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race according to the flesh is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, if you uh, aren't familiar as, as uh, with the book of Romans, well, today will be a little short uh, primer for you, but this section of Romans comes at the end of a eight chapter, as it's been given to us, uh, section of the letter whereby Paul sort of unravels and unveils the her cosmic scope of God's saving work in the world. He begins with a depiction of, of the state of fallen humanity in Adam that we, are, that we have, have rejected, that suppressed the truth of God by actively suppressing the knowledge of God and then worshiping idols. And he says this is the, the judgment that lies at the heart of the human person. And then he works out that God's plan for redemption, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and yet that's not the final word, that the promise given to Abraham as he works out in chapters 4 and 5 and 6, the promise given to Abraham was fulfilled in Christ and then secured for us by Christ's death and resurrection, that by faith, all who now, as he writes in Romans chapter 5, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom we have received reconciliation by his blood. And we go, we see him work out baptism in chapter 6, and then we see Romans 7 was this amazing introspective cry about the war that goes on inside the flesh, of the battle of the spirit and the flesh and the law, and, and the way that this, this turmoil arises in the heart of a Christian. Because by faith we have been given to see what we should do and what we ought to do and who we ought to be. And yet we know how, how far we fall from that aspirational idea. And yet, Romans chapter 8, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so Paul lays this out in these first eight chapters. And then we come to Romans chapter 9 where he begins to question in right, written form 
with the promises of God. He begins to say, I wish that I myself were cut off, accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Speaking about the Jews who at this point in the writing of Paul to the letter to Romans had not accepted had rejected Christ. Not all Jews, of course, all the early apostles were Jews. They were, they were Jews who came to see that Jesus was in fact the Messiah. Like Thomas, remember Thomas, when he puts his hands in the wounds, he says, my Lord and my God, man theo, man, man, man uh, 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 kyrios. And we have this, theos and kyrios, we have this confession. But Paul was reflecting, well, what about the promises of God to the Jews? Had they failed? Could God, in fact, be trusted. And this is a very uh, cause for concern for Paul, so much so that he spends the next two chapters, uh, a lot of ink spilled, as it were, in chapters 9, 10, and 11, reflecting on what this could mean. Was God untrustworthy? Did those promises fail? Could God, in fact, be believed? Well, I commend those three chapters to you uh, for your own edification, because we see in that the, the, the work of a, of a preacher, one who has been confronted with the risen Christ, one who has, been, has begin, been given repentance, who has turned from his former way of life and now lives for Christ and is worried about those who he calls his brothers, his brothers and sisters who, who do not believe. And that is a deep concern for, for any uh, pastor, one that should be prayerfully considered. And we have a leader in that consideration in the Apostle Paul. And so he begins to question. He begins to say, well, well, God cannot lie. God cannot go against himself. And so there's this, this, this seeming mystery about the promises that are yet unfulfilled for those who are at this time rejecting Christ, as he says. And yet God is faithful. God is trustworthy, and he goes back, as is the case throughout the entire scriptures, to not, um, uh, to, to, not the, to, to mind the ends of the mysteries of God, but to reflect and take comfort in what has been revealed about God. Because as we grow in the knowledge of what we know about God, then we are, or, or we are, are more capable of letting the things that he has not revealed to us uh, remain in his purview, and we trust, in fact, what he has revealed. This is, in fact, what the Apostle Paul concludes with in this section, where he begins to talk about this great mystery, and he ends this section by saying this, Oh, this is Romans chapter 11, verse 33, Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments, and how inscrutable his ways! For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. You see, the Apostle Paul takes as, our, as his starting point what God has revealed to him, namely the resurrected Christ on the road to Damascus. And in that context, he began to put all of the history of Israel and all of the future of the church in context. And he begins to reflect on the riches and the mystery and the majesty of God. And in that relationship and on that foundation, he can then allow this mystery about the, the promises foretold to the Jews that seem to him to be, to be under uh, contention at this time. Nevertheless, he gives that question to God knowing and resting in what he already knows about who God is, who his heart, how his heart beats for the lost and the, 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 90, the one sheep out of the 99, for the prodigal, for, for the sake of the world. And he rests in that worship of that God. And so it's unsurprising that after this little interlude in chapters 9, 10, and 11, he goes back to what he knows. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Well, when we are in our world, which is full of of opportunities to doubt the goodness of God, 
It is full of um, the assaults of the devil, the arrows of the devil, as Paul talks about in Philippians. That when we are tempted, as one will be, to forget the goodness, the, the trustworthiness, and the majesty of God, well then all we have to do, all we are, the, the glory of what we get to do, is to return to what we know about who he is and who his heart, how his heart beats. And then we are refreshed and renewed and restored once again, just as the Apostle Paul, just as the leaders of the early church, just as Christians have been throughout the history of the church by the power of the Spirit. You have been given a testimony. It's not my testimony, it's not my witness to the world, but it's yours. And it's one that has been hard wrought through the wind and waves of life. And yet it is true that I can speak to you about how God has met me at the times of greatest need, about how he has comforted me in times of great despair and pain, about how he has, he has held me fast in the midst of the wind and waves of life. And that that is my song, that oh, how unsearchable and how the depths and riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. And yet will we praise him, yet will we sing to him, yet will we continue to witness. And so in conclusion, I hope, as I often say, that you will uh, take this time uh, will take your life, but take this particular time of uncertainty and confusion in many people's lives to return to, to the scriptures, to return to what we know, to what has been revealed to us by God himself for our sake, and read in the, the humanity of Abraham, in the wrestling of Jacob, in the, in the, 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 uh, at, at the Jabbok, in the, the history of the patriarchs of Israel, in, the, in the, the long suffering of God with his often faithless people, of, and finally of his, of his work on the cross for the redemption of the world. Read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest this amazing story of God's amazing grace, and take heart and be edified be strengthened, supported, and secured once again in God's amazing love through Christ for you and for the sake of the world. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, just a few announcements for you here today. Uh, as always, since you're watching this on Facebook and we, um, assuming you have come through uh, the website to some degree, we are doing our best to keep all of the information, all of the relevant information on our website under the COVID-19 response. So please, that's ChristCH.org. Uh, you can find all of the information, links to our discipleship classes, which are continuing, links to the services. You can go back and listen to them as I know you, you are want to do. Um, and you can um, find all of our information. We're, again, always grateful to our wonderful communications director, Katie Hunter, for her tireless work um, during this, uh, particular at all times, but particularly during this, um, this time of virtual social distancing. So to that end, I want to make an announcement. Some of you may have received an email that because of the demand and our commitment to social distancing, we are going back to two services. We are reaching capacity for a safe and socially distant service in one. So beginning next week, not this week, but the 23rd, we are going back to a 9 a.m. contemporary service in the parish hall and then an 11 a.m. traditional service in the main church. And that is set up so that we are eventually going to be bringing back our Sunday discipleship between the two services. We are, God, God willing, depending on the, what comes in the future, beginning to consider bringing back various aspects of our of our children and youth ministry on Sunday mornings. And so we want to get back to the um, the standard of what we what we used to just follow nine o'clock and 11 o'clock. So mark your calendars and most importantly, please register. There will be, as always, um, some, some margin for people who come without registering, but it will be incredibly helpful for us and, and enable us to be as, as safe and as prepared as possible if you would register. So that is registration, comes out in email, you can call the office, you can um, go online in our website, there's a variety of ways, and please feel free to call the office if you have any difficulty excuse me, registering at all. Okay, in conclusion uh, to our announcements, uh, be 
on the lookout. Be prayerful for your leaders, particularly Father Ted and Bishop Lawrence and all of the people who are carrying the weight of this responsibility of us of gathering very heavily. Um, and we are grateful for their wise and courageous leadership during this time. But be prayerful and be uh, prepared um, for for uh, the rolling back out of our socially distanced, but nevertheless um, committed uh, discipleship offerings in the fall. We are still working on putting together what that will look like and when it will take place, but, but Mark, um, just be uh, in your own life considering um, this fall uh, how we will we will continue to work under the admonition of the Apostle Paul or the writers of the letter of Hebrews do not do not uh, forsake meeting together as some are wont to do um, we will continue to as Acts 2 says uh, continue to to follow the teaching of the Apostles the fellowship and the breaking of the bread together by God's grace um, and we look forward to seeing you. Uh, we have been grateful to see many of you and look forward to seeing you um, back with us this fall. So I will conclude today with um, a prayer that we have been praying throughout this um, pandemic and send you on your way. So the Lord be with you and with your spirit. Let us pray. Almighty and most merciful God, in this time of the coronavirus pandemic and all other perils of our world, we plead to you for strength and protection. Deliver us, we beseech you, from our peril. Give skill and success to all those who minister to the sick by prospering the means made use of for their care and cure. And grant that, perceiving how frail and uncertain our life is, we may apply our hearts to that heavenly wisdom which leads to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, our crucified and risen Savior, Jesus Christ, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. So until next week, stay safe, stay connected, and pray for Christ's church.